Can everyone hear? <laughs> Loud and clear? Well, it's nice to look out over this sea of smiling faces again. And it looks like the smiling faces are getting more and more in number. This might be our biggest crowd. We'll do a hard count after a while, but I'm guessing at least 75. So that's great. Uh, I'll introduce my mother. Here she is, almost 91, and she's still coming to these things to protect me. And then my lovely wife, Paulette, was able to come. She's still working. Uh, she has a real job, so, you know, one of us has to work. So, Here's a few programs coming up uh, in the future, uh, which I've gone over before, so I'll, I'll try and do it fairly quickly. May 30th, Clay Stuckey uh, will give a presentation on the grist mills of Indiana. Uh, one of them was actually built by my, my ancestor, Billy Carter, and we went and found the site a couple, three months ago. And uh, this should be really good. Clay's given probably at least four or five programs before, I think. Uh, June 27th, Duncan Campbell will give a program on the uh, stone quarries and mills of the area. And uh, in this, he shows many rare and vintage uh, photos in his presentation. And I've seen this before, uh, probably about a year ago. And uh, this is an excellent, excellent program. Uh, July 25th, Steve Rolfe. Uh, the Civil War Roundtable will return and give a program about Captain David Buskirk, who was the tallest guy in the Union Army around 611, I think. And then he also talks about the preservation of some of the local cemeteries. Uh, August 29th, another return presenter, Dan Combs. He's a local historian and retired history teacher. will repeat his program on the, uh, the great flu epidemic, the great Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. Uh, he gave that about two years ago here, and it's fascinating. Uh, September, Bob Hamill, I think most people know who Bob Hamill is. Uh, he's going to give a program, I've also seen this one, on the uh, great black athletes of Monroe County, the pioneering black athletes like George Talaferro, George Shively, Bill Garrett, and some others, and uh, looking forward to that. Now we're down to October. I just talked to Dave Williams not long ago. He's uh, with the uh, City Parks Department, and he'll do one he also did uh, probably a couple of years ago on Cascades Park, the history of that. And I told him to also try and incorporate some of the other parks too, like Bryan, 3rd Street, and, and uh, Building and Trades Park in his program, and he will. And then uh, Brad Cook who, uh, will return in November to do uh, part three of his history of IU. I think he left off around 1930 last time, so he'll continue from that point. So, uh, and now George will make a few words here. Uh, Mike, Mike says I'd like to welcome you all. Um, can you hear me? I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, how many of you are first-time attendees today? Just raise your hand, please. Okay, if you would, uh, if you care to, if you want to be on our email list, let me know at the end of the presentation. Just give me your name and email address, and I will include you on our distribution list. Uh, it's becoming quite sizable now. Uh, to thank cats for coming. Uh, you guys are always welcome. And in that regard, this past uh, yesterday, I released a new in video index. How many of you received that? Do you ever look at those pictures? Go, go through that? It should be easy. The only thing you need to do is click on the blue part of the, of the uh, paragraph, and it should take you directly to the presentation. So any presentation that we've done in the last year and a half is now included in that. We've like 13, 14 presentations in there that are excellent about what we can do. I'd like to see this uh, logo up here for the Monon Railroad Society. This has a lot to do with, with our presentation today. And I'd like to uh, thank and welcome our photo archives director, Ron Markowitz who is a former engineer for the Monon Railroad. Hello, 
all met for a plain political announcement. I have been recently appointed the membership director for the Monon Railroad, so we'll be talking to all of you about how you might like to become members. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Legion uh, for letting us be here today. I'd like for you all to be, if you can, be particularly generous to our servers. Uh, uh, this is uh, how they make money, we, and they do a really good job considering for uh, what we what come in, a lot of people. And Mike, I wish I would put my glasses on for this. Let's see. Can I help you? Uh, introduce. Jake. <laughs> uh, several years ago, yep, when our Monon Railroad headquarters was in Landon, Indiana, uh, some, I was up there one day working in the archives, and this young college student comes in, and he says, hi, I want to learn more about the Monon Railroad. I said, well, we want to teach you. So we had John Jake Butler become a member of the Monon Society. And it's been nothing but good times ever since. Uh, Jake is a part of the family that owns the Butler Winery. And uh, I think at this point, before I stub along anymore, I'll turn it over to you, Jake. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank the Monroe County History Club for having me here. I would also like to thank George Lortz for providing photographs uh, of the flood. I'd like to thank Clay Stuckey for providing photographs and maps. And I would especially like to thank Ron Markward for helping me in the process and providing me with photographs from the Monon Railroad Historical Technical Society's archive. They're a great, great resource. <clears throat> All right, this is about Bloomington, 1913, the flood, the drought, and the railroad. So first off, a real quick introduction of the year 1913. In February, the 16th Amendment was ratified, authorizing Congress to collect income tax. We've been paying for that ever since. <laughs> On March 3rd, there was a women's suffrage pr procession in Washington, D.C., uh, protesting, asking for the right to vote. The next day, Woodrow Wilson was sworn in as the 28th president. In July, the United States celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And in Russia, they celebrated the 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty. They only had four left. <laughs> Mexico was in the news. The Mexican Civil War began in 1913. The guy right there is Pancho Villa. The uh, first Balkan War ended in 1913, and the second Balkan War ended and, or began and ended in 1913. Pretty efficient. Grand Central Terminal in New York City was completed after being under construction for 10 years. It took so long because the terminal had to be open the entire time that it was under construction. So here it is being constructed, getting in focus too as it goes along. So that was completed in 1913. Also, oh, that's the main terminal, or the main concourse of the terminal. Also in 1913, the Woolworth Building was completed, becoming the world's tallest, a title it held for 30 years. That was also in New York City. Ford Motor Company invented the moving assembly line, which cut car manufacturing times from 12 and a half hours to two hours. <clears throat> Also in 1913, that Lincoln Highway was announced. It was the first coast-to-coast -coast highway, although at, in the beginning it was really nothing more than a series of painted telephone poles. <laughs> Here's the condition of the highway. This is 14 miles from the Indiana-Illinois border uh, nearing Chicago. So deaths. Some famous people died. 
Thaddeus Lowe, the head of the Union Balloon Corps during the Civil War, died in 1913, as did Harriet Tubman, so we're, who was a, born a slave, became an abolitionist, abolitionist and women's rights advocate. J.P. Morgan died in 1913, as did Aaron Montgomery Ward, inventor of the mail order company, and Ambrose Bierce, who was a Union veteran and author who disappeared in the Mexican Civil War in 1913. How about people who were born? We have two presidents, Richard Nixon, the 37th, Gerald Ford, the 38th, three football coaches, Woody Hayes, Vince Lombardi, Paul Bear Bryant, civil rights icon, Rosa Parks, organized labor icon, Jimmy Hoffa, blues great, Muddy Waters, Olympic track star, Jesse Owens, actors, Lloyd Bridges, Burt Lancaster, Hedy Lamar. Vivian Lee. So, that's 1913 real quick. <laughs> but the real reason I want to talk about 1913 is the weather. And the weather in 1913, well, it was exceptional and memorable. <clears throat> Consider Death Valley. On January 8, 1913, Death Valley recorded its coldest temperature ever which was eight degrees. Doesn't sound that cold to us, but that's cold for Death Valley. That sa same year, 1913, on July 10th, the thermometer at Furnace Creek, Death Valley, read 134 degrees, which is the hottest temperature ever recorded in the history of Earth, also in 1913. So in the same year, Death Valley has its coldest temperature and its hottest temperature. I thought this uh, slide had too much green in it to really be Death Valley. So I wanted to close with this shot to <laughs> give you a better idea of what Death Valley is like. I've never been there. I don't. 1913 was a bad weather year in other ways. Uh, there was a series of tornadoes that struck the Midwest and South. This is a, a photograph of the tornado that struck Omaha. Um, and the tornadoes would kill around 250 people. That's also destruction, in, also destruction in Omaha, and once again, Omaha. A great flood would occur in 1913, damaging the country from the Midwest to the eastern seaboard, killing an estimated 650 people and doing hundreds of millions of dollars in property damage. We don't know the exact figure, and that is in 1913 money. So in today's money, that would be astronomical. Um, here's a slide of Louisville. There's uh, Aurora, Indiana. This is a slide in Cleveland. This is the William H. Mack hitting a bridge during the flood. Parkersburg, West Virginia. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's a major, major flood, one of the largest to ever occur in the United States. That same year, there was a summer drought and a heat wave from California to New England. This is... Uh, uh, paper from Santa Rosa, California, and here's another paper from Kansas, fires sweeping because of the drought. There was a great white hurricane in November which hit the Great Lakes. Uh, this is the Chicago lakefront during the great white hurricane. Um, sank 19 ships killed uh, approximately 250 people and dumped uh, 17 inches of snow on Cleveland in six hours. In December, 1913 just wasn't done yet, in December a series of blizzards would hit Denver dumping 57 inches of snow in the month of December. That's a lot of snow, almost two inches every day. So. This lecture is the story of the weather in 1913 and how it affected Bloomington. And really, it's a story about water. And because this story takes place in 1913, an era where all stories get back to the railroad, this is also the story of Bloomington and its railroads. So, Bloomington and the flood. The first flood to hit Bloomington in 1913 was man-made. 
On January 17th, the dam of the Monon Pond collapsed and flooded the district below for about a mile to the south, including flooding the homes of uh, Gordon Back and Luther Tell, and they had to be rescued. Now, uh, the next day, the paper announced that the Monon Pond would be rebuilt, and this time the dam would be made permanent. And I'm sure the neighbors who lived below the dam were happy to hear that, because this was the third time that the dam had washed out since 1902, when the pond was constructed. This, this is a slide showing the Monon Pond. Um, it was located just slightly south of Rose Hill Cemetery. It was a mild winter. Uh, this, is, this is from March, and actually the first uh, snow of the year didn't occur until March 1st. So it had been a rainy, rainy winter, but it wasn't a cold winter. Uh, and this, this article talks about the snowplow being called out for the first time that day on March 1st. This is how weather forecasts were generally delivered. You'd get like a sentence or two in the paper. This is March 8th, it's, and March is coming in nice and gentle for Bloomington. It's a fair days. And about half the month of March was pretty easy. The first half, the first 15 days of March, good weather. But then from March 15th on, the weather took a turn for the worst. On March 15th, we have a windstorm that sweeps over the city. Uh, it injured one co-ed, broke a branch off a tree on campus. So the branch hit her in the head. Uh, she was able to make it to a building where she was treated. It seemed like she would recover. Um, it blew down trees. It damaged roofs. It took down telegraph and telephone poles. But it was all fairly minor damage. So that's March 15th. And then on the 19th, uh, the weather forecast was for more rain, warmer temperatures. The next day, on the 20th, a cold front came through with snow flurries. These mixing of warm and cold fronts, of course, produces violent weather. And so on March 21st, the first day of spring, another windstorm swept through the county. The biggest damage that it did was it ripped the roof off of the relatively new university observatory. Uh, it also broke plate glass windows at several local businesses and took down the chimney of a poor Dr. Rothrock, which unfortunately fell onto his house. In the southern United States, the damage from this same series of storms was much more severe. On the 21st, tornadoes hit Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Particularly hard hit was Lower Peachtree, Alabama. Storms would strike the south for the next two days. The overall death toll from the southern tornadoes was 47 or 48, depending on who you ask. Sunday, March 23rd, was Easter Sunday. It started out as a nice day in the Midwest. And the People went all around to their different, which, <laughs> thanks, sir. <laughs> and the people went around to their different Easter celebrations and were enjoying the day. As the day went along, though, a cold front came in. And the cold front came from the Rocky Mountains, and it dropped down over the Great Plains. And by late afternoon and early evening, winds were picking up. The temperature dropped dramatically, in some places 20 degrees in the matter of an hour. So that's a heck of a front coming through. Now, this isn't a weather map from 1913. And the reason I have this up there is because they didn't have weather maps in 1913. Like I said, your prediction was a couple sentences in the paper. They could measure pre pressure, they, did, they were able to predict weather, but they hadn't come up with frontal theory. So all these lines here on the map, those wouldn't have been there. They wouldn't have known about that. So there wasn't somebody on that day saying, in the late afternoon, expect dramatic change in the weather with temperatures dropping and a front coming in. We're trained, right, for the weatherman, we all know that. Or if this was like a history channel documentary, 
Little did they know that a wall of liquid death was about to descend upon them. <laughs> Around 6 p.m., a cluster of huge tornadoes, either F4 or F5, F5 is as big as they get, hit Omaha, Nebraska. The storm would kill over 100 people. Um, this is a slide of the destruction in Omaha. Here's a cartoon in the Omaha Bee that appeared right after the tornado, listing the, listing the losses as well. Around by 9.45 p.m., the violent edge of this storm had reached Indiana. And this is a map of Terre Haute. And the unfortunate city of Terre Haute would be visited by the, the storm. Uh, it would produce another tornado. This tornado, or it could have been perhaps a series of tornadoes, there's some differing accounts, but this tornado uh, would hit the southwest side of the city and in about two minutes would uh, kill 21 people, injure 250, and cut a swath of destruction through Terre Haute. Now this is a map that a lady named Trudy E. Bell put together. She has an excellent web page on the uh, Great Flood called Our National Calamity. And what she did is she actually plotted the course of the tornado from newspaper reports. So you can see it just cut right across the city, kind of picked up, hit again, picked up, hit again, and again, and so on and so forth. This is the uh, damage to the root glass factory. The root glass factory made Coca-Cola bottles in Terre Haute. It was completely destroyed by the tornado. This is another scene from Terre Haute. <clears throat> Shortly after the tornado, fires broke out in the city. The fires were caused by lightning. They were caused by uh, broken gas lines and downed electrical wires. Once the fire started, because of the winds, the blaze quickly spread, and it looked like Terre Haute would be hit by a tornado and then burned down all in the same evening. Luckily, a torrential rainstorm hit, putting out the fires in Terre Haute, much to the firemen's delight. Unfortunately, the torrential rainstorm then produced catastrophic flooding. Talk about a bad day to be in Terre Haute. This is uh, the next day's headlines in Bloomington. The storm passes over Bloomington, or the front, rather, passes over Bloomington. But instead of getting high winds and damaging uh, tornadoes, Bloomington gets rain. The night of the 23rd was uneventful. Early in the morning of the 24th, it began raining. And by early in the evening of the 24th, the amount of rain had become alarming. And it just kept coming down. So Bloomington flooded. Now this is really unusual because Bloomington is high and dry. We're, we are not on a major river. We don't have any large sources of water around us. So it would be unusual for Bloomington to flood. The March 25th Bloomington Evening World described the scene. The deluge caused the River Jordan, the classic stream that passes through the campus of Indiana University, to overflow its bounds as never before and damage much valuable property adjacent to the campus. Here we have a slide of the classic stream, the River Jordan. The stream became rapidly swollen uh, after supper last night, and by 10 o'clock had formed a lake on East 6th Street, East Kirkwood Avenue, East 4th Street, and one block on Indiana Avenue. So here we have a map of the city of Bloomington, and the flooding is basically going to be localized along the Jordan River. So here's the Jordan River. There's flooding here. Then there's going to be flooding on Kirkwood right here. Uh, the bridge at 4th Street between Grant and Lincoln Streets was damaged heavily. Most of the stone abutments were washed out or torn loose. The flood was also bad in the south part of the city. The Nisley residence south of 2nd Street and between Washington and Walnut Streets. So let me find it. There's Walnut. There's Washington. Down here. See the creek right there? That's the creek that's flooding. Um, between Washington and Walnut Streets was 
the Knisley residence, south of 2nd and between Washington and Walnut Streets, was torn loose from its foundation, and the wood shed and the outhouses were washed away. I wonder who found the outhouses. Um, the Knisley family was rescued at 9.30 and taken to the homes of neighbors on South Lincoln Street between 3rd Street and Smith Avenue. The William Bartlett and Shelthouse families also had to be rescued. Backwater covered East 2nd Street and filled all of the basements. The powerhouse at the university was flooded. And as the paper said, it was a night of anxious moments for many residents, especially on 6th Street, Kirkwood Avenue, and 4th Streets, where there was little sleeping done. The oldest inhabitants have no recollection when the stream ever was so high before. The bridge over the Jordan River at Smith Avenue was swept away. Now, today the Jordan River, after it's done with campus, disappears into this uh, bridge and passes underneath the city of Bloomington. And we don't have the surface water anymore. Um, it's still there, it's flowing in these culverts underneath the streets, but we no longer think of a stream going right through downtown Bloomington. It doesn't emerge again until, oh, down by below 2nd Street near to Kroger's, and that's where the stream finally comes back out. Every once in a while it makes an appearance if we get a particularly hard rain, even after the big dig, which was supposed to solve all of the flooding problems. But this area of Kirkwood is the exact same area that was being flooded in 1913. So it's nice to know that some things never change. So what year is that? You know what? I have no idea. It's not 1913, I can tell you that for sure. So all this rain that was falling uh, was on top of already saturated ground and it led to immediate flash flooding, not just in Bloomington, but throughout the whole region. Heavy rain also caused landslides and washouts, all of which cut railroad and telegraph lines throughout the Midwest and then spread eastward. This is a map showing the rainfall uh, for March 23rd to 27th. And well, I don't know why they only had green, if there was some sort of budget shortage, and so they were like, well, we'll just use green. But uh, you can see the darkest green is the heaviest rainfall, and that band pretty much comes right across where Bloomington is. The Professor E.E. E. Ramsey, who kept the government weather gauge for Bloomington, said that Bloomington had received six and a half inches of rain in 24 hours. So all this rain coming down throughout the whole region, and it starts to cause a lot of damage. And hit over and over again are the means of communication and transportation. So this is a slide of Beardstown, Illinois, as the railroad levee is being washed away. I would not be standing there if I were them. <laughs> this is in Carroll County, uh, near Delphi washed out track. This is Lawrenceburg, Indiana, or near Lawrenceburg. And so, let me, well, it doesn't matter. And so really, Bloomington is no exception to this pattern of flooding, and loss of communication, damaged transportation. As the paper noted on the 25th of March, at 2.30 this afternoon, Bloomington was for the first time in many years cut off entirely from communication with the outside world. The Western Union telegraph wires, seven in all, went down and refused to work, and all long-distance connections with Indianapolis were shut off. In addition, not a train had entered or left the city during the day. Both the Monon and the Illinois Central Railroad agents announced at 2.45 this afternoon that there will be no trains on either road before tomorrow morning. Unfortunately, it was longer than the next day. So, this is now about the flood and the railroad. The relationship of Bloomington, the railroad, and the telegraph, which is so nicely illustrated by this slide, right? With the Bloomington Depot. We have the railroad, and we have my favorite telegraph pole. <laughs> the railroad had come to Bloomington in 1854. 
The Western Union telegraph lines had come to the city in 1859, and they'd followed the right-of-way of the railroad. Matter of fact, the Monon was happy to get the telegraph because it allowed them to communicate faster than the train. Imagine the fastest way you could send a message was by a train, and your train takes off. There's no way to send it a message. So the telegraph allowed them to communicate faster than the trains that they were driving. So the railroad allowed Bloomington to have fast, efficient, and relatively cheap uh, transportation. And the telegraph allowed nearly instant communication. And over the last 50 years, Bloomington had gotten pretty used to having both of them all the time. Bloomington was connected to two railroads. This is a map of the Monon. Um, well, commonly called the Monon, and we'll just leave it at that. Uh, its reporting marks change over the years. It connected Bloomington efficiently with Louisville and Chicago. And then there we are right there. But Bloomington also had another railroad by 1913. This was a branch of the Illinois Central that connected from Effingham, Illinois to Indianapolis. So there's the ham of Effingham. There's Indianapolis, and of course we're right here. And these two railroads cross in Bloomington. This is a map of Monroe County, and you can see where the railroads cross. So on March 25th, the railroad situation was as follows. On the Monon to the north, this is, this is the Monon's line coming through right here. This is the Illinois Central's line right here. On the Monon to the north, the Jack's Defeat Creek in Ellettsville had gone on a rampage, according to the paper. Where's, there's Ellettsville, and it wiped out track at Ellettsville. It had flooded the, ma the main street of Ellettsville as well. Here's a photograph of normally calm Jack's Defeat Creek when it's not rampaging. Um, and this is the footbridge right behind the depot. Whoops. Go back. Uh, further up the line at Bray Fogle, the flood washed out the track for a mile and a half, so the track was just gone. And further up the line, just you can see the port of Gosport. There was serious flooding. This is a picture of the Gosport Bridge. Uh, this is an interesting bridge because it straddled the county line, and so the uh, Monroe County half of the bridge was still covered, where the Owen County half of the bridge had been replaced with iron. So uh, here's what the bridge looked like normally, just to give you an example of the scale of the flooding. I would imagine it's probably 15 feet from the river up to the, the base of the bridge. And so we can see that it's flooded the valley completely. This is a slide of the Gosport Depot. Uh, it was also completely flooded. And here's a comparison slide of the Gosport Depot and River Valley when it's not flooded. So serious problems at Gosport. And this is another view of the Gosport Depot. Can you ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Some of them, like some of them towns are mentioned, they're not, like Ketchum and, and some, are them towns, some of them towns ain't around no more. Those are, are not towns actually, they're railroad stops. So Ketchum was a depot, it was just on his farm, it never really amounted to, to being a town. Um, so, the destruction wasn't over though, Bloomington's cut off up this line, but they still have other options. To the south, though, the Monon was blocked again. This line right here ran along Clear Creek, and it was complete. It's, it's a mess at the time of the flood, pretty much. It has 14 bridges or 16 bridges, depending on how you look at it. It's closed down. This line over Smithville was still open, but unfortunately, right after Smithville is Harrodsburg, and Harrodsburg's down in the River Valley, and it was flooded. 
This is not from the 1913 flood. This is taken sometime in the 1930s, but it shows the valley at Harrodsburg under heavy water. And the photogra photographer, Joe Bennett's climbed up on top of the water tower, and he's taking a picture of this train. And we actually get to see, if it'll advance, get to see the train progress across the valley. So here it is now heading north. Uh, we can see all the water at Harrodsburg. In 1913, the water at Harrodsburg's over the tracks, so it's actually a worse flood than this. But so the Monon's cut at Harrodsburg. It's another shot of Harrodsburg. Now the Illinois Central's nickname was the high dry or the high and dry. So it would seem odd that the Illinois Central would suffer any problems with the flood, but it certainly did. To the west, there were washouts. And the railroad had been constructed on a lot of fill, and some of that fill gave way. And so in multiple places between uh, Bloomfield and Sullivan, the railroad was washed out. The fill had given way. To the east, the Illinois Central comes up here, has to cross over the Bean Blossom Creek Valley, uh, and then up by Trevlack. Lake Lemon wasn't built yet. But it had to cross all of the streams that eventually feed Lake Lemon. And here, the Illinois Central was flooded as well. Here's a photo of the Trevlack Depot. Um, I don't know what they use the ladder for. And here's a photo of the modern Plum Creek Bridge. Plum Creek Bridge was one of the bridges that was washed out at Trevlack. And it was totally destroyed in the 1913 flood, so this, this bridge is its replacement. And it wasn't... wasn't finally replaced until 1915. A temporary bridge was built in 1913, pile driving, uh, but in 1915 they went ahead and put in a concrete bridge. So the Illinois Central was cut at Trevlack and it was cut to the west. So Bloomington's cut to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. You're not going anywhere. Um, The next day, the 26th, the situation was revealed to be more dire in the surrounding region than first expected. The Bloomington Evening World was still reporting and even printing extras to keep up with the demand for news, but without telegraph connections, they had sort of a squishy feeling of what the news was. It was hard to say exactly what was happening throughout the Midwest. So they, they were reporting things like... Uh, Right here, Dayton, Ohio is flooded. They know that. But look at the estimate of casualties that they're giving in the Bloomington paper. 5,000 people have been killed in Dayton, Ohio. It was bad, but it wasn't nearly that bad. <clears throat> um, actually, they estimate that around 120 people were killed in Dayton, Ohio. So you see what I mean? That Without the telegraph, where things start to get squishy. But there was, real, there was immense damage. This is a photograph of Main Street in Dayton, Ohio. Another photograph of Main Street, Dayton. These little things here, those are the street lights. So it's just up to the top of the street lights. Here's the suburbs of Dayton. So it was seriously flooded. The paper was correct. The, on the 27th, the paper reported that Peru, Indiana's circus city, was badly flooded. This was true. But once again, the paper would overestimate casualties. Hundreds are reported. In actuality, 11 people were killed in Peru. This is a slide of damage in Peru, Indiana. I know. What kind of journalists were these people? Uh, hey, there's a dead elephant. I want you to go stand on its back and I'm going to take your picture. This is the uh, elephant from the Wallace Brothers Circus that was killed during the flood. Many circus animals perished during the flood and it added to Peru's woes because you can imagine not only did they have all the, the dead horses and cows that came with the flood, but they have big circus animals as well that they have to take care of. Uh, reports of flooding in Indianapolis also made the local papers. And once again, deaths were greatly inflated. They reported 1,500 deaths in Indianapolis. Five were actually confirmed. <laughs> but once again, the paper was right. Destruction was great. Uh, this is the Washington Street Bridge. Well, <laughs> what's left of it? This is the Kingan Packing Company, which is about where Victory Field is now in downtown Indianapolis. 
Bloomington also had local fellas who died during the flood. Not in Bloomington, but in other places. <clears throat> The paper reported the death of Leland Woolery. Where is he? Wow. I just, I just skipped ahead. Right here. Um, Leland Woolery was the son of a traveling man. He had graduated from Bloomington High School, and he'd gone to Lafayette and just began his studies at Purdue University. He died on the afternoon of the 24th, trying to rescue people from the Brown Street levee, which was cut off by the raging waters of the Wabash. Against the advice of a gathered crowd, he and another student, G.B. Eli, launched their canoe into the floodwaters. About 30 feet from the shore, their boat was swamped by a wave. Leland disappeared, never to be seen again, alive. But Eli was saved by climbing onto the roof of a nearby barn. Uh, Leland's body would not be recovered until April 5th. So this is what Lafayette looked like during the flood, and that's the Wabash River that he bravely, perhaps foolishly, launched his boat into. The flood would destroy several of the bridges in downtown Lafayette. Um, when they finally found Leland's body uh, on April 5th, he was brought back to Bloomington, where he is buried at Rose Hill Cemetery under this completely unremarkable stone. There, at the time of his burial, there was calls for a monument in his honor either in Bloomington or in Lafayette. And to my knowledge, that monument was never built. Um, but if you would like to visit his grave, it is in Rose Hill. It's hard to find. The other local casualty was Roma May, who also died trying to save others. May, formerly of Bloomington, was a conductor on the CNO Railroad, and he was living in Peru when the flood occurred. On the 21st, uh, 24th, in the midst of the worst flooding, he launched a boat and uh, spent the whole day saving people in Peru. It's estimated that he saved 200 citizens of Peru, Indiana, before he, towards evening, he took on his last bunch of passengers, which included a agitated woman. The agitated woman upset the boat. He drowned, and so did the agitated woman. So those are Bloomington's flood casualties. Now, since Bloomington is an important point on both of these railroads, even though Bloomington is cut off from the rest of the state, it still has train crews and trains in Bloomington that it can use to repair its lines. So as soon as the flooding has finished, the railroad crews are already out working trying to get these lines back open. So uh, The damage at Ellettsville is repaired very quickly. It wasn't that bad. Within two days, they've got a mile and a half of track redone at Brayfogle. It's just amazing how quickly they were able to repair this sort of damage. Um, Gosport's more of a problem because it's still flooded, as is Harrodsburg. On the Illinois Central, they were able to repair most of the bridges at Trevlack within two days. Plum Creek Bridge took a little bit longer because they had to get a pile driver from Bloomfield. Um, by the 26th, uh, it looked like the line could be opened all the way from Bloomington to Morgantown, but from Morgantown to Indianapolis, it was still underwater. So by March 28th, Bloomington was still isolated, but it was no longer cut off. Uh, this was now Friday, and the storms had started on uh, Sunday night, Monday morning. By Tuesday, communication and travel had ceased, and so it had been a long week. On the 28th, the Illinois Central succeeded in getting a train from Morgantown to Bloomington. The train had been delayed at Morgantown since Monday. So those poor passengers had left Indianapolis for their hour and a half trip to Bloomington, and it had taken them five days. Um, Indianapolis was still cut off by flooding on the south side, but taxis were able to take patrons around the flooded section and reconnect them with the railroad. So by the 28th, Bloomington has some tenuous connections with Indianapolis again. On the Monon, things were looking promising. To the south, the waters around Harrodsburg were beginning to recede. And to the north, the Monon sent an inspection train, which got all the way to the White River and was able to cross the bridge. This is a photo of the, not of 1913, but of the Monon Bridge uh, over the White River. The bridge was okay. It, they could get a train over it. And so they 
approached Gosport. They got to within about a mile of Gosport, though, and they couldn't get any farther. The tracks were still flooded. So the Monon officials on the train wanted to get word to the citizens of Gosport that help was on the way, that they weren't that far away. And so they had the trainmen blow the whistle. And they blew the whistle, and they blew the whistle. And then after a while, people from Gosport started coming to the top of the hill. And then the guys on the train started waving tablecloths to communicate with the citizens of Gosport. It didn't work. The citizens of Gosport were completely confused by what was going on. When they first heard the train whistle, they were convinced that something terrible had occurred in Steinsville, and maybe the town was washed away. Um, and then when they saw that it was a train, they, the guys were on top waving tablecloths. Maybe the train was in distress. They didn't know. The train was in distress. What was going on? So we now come to one of the unsung heroes of this tale. This is the Gosport Depot. And it's kind of down the hill, so this is, this is from up the hill. This is where the citizens of Gosport are gathering, um, looking at this strange train. And so within 15 minutes, a man from Gosport crosses the river in a gas motor launch. And this man remains nameless to history. He's known only as the uh, gas motor launch man. But here's the uh, description in the paper. Within 15 minutes, a man from Gosport answered by coming across the river in a, oh, sorry, gasoline launch. He alighted from the boat and came up to the train where he conversed with the officials for several minutes. He said the continued blowing of the whistle caused the Gosport people to believe that there was a great distress up towards Steinsville. The man also said the water had receded from the Monon Depot and the agent had started a fire to dry it out. Agent Humston on the train had a copy of the Daily World in his pocket and handed it to the man. He said Gosport had been entirely boxed in and had not received a single word of any kind as to the ex extent of the flood or to the damages. He said that the copy of the world would be posted at the post office where every citizen of the town could see and read it. <clears throat> and then the article concludes, the Monon hauled 30 carloads of broken stone this morning to near Gosport to repair the roadbed, and it is now believed it will be possible to get a train through not later than Sunday. This is a really cool photograph. Well, I think it is anyway, because here is the fill just near Gosport. This is the, the part of the railroad that was washed out, and we can see the cut stone, limestone quarry scrap that they've brought up and dumped in here to fill in the fill. So this is taken within days of the 1913 flood just after they've repaired the Gosport line, or I suspect. So at the same time, while the gasoline launch man was there, Agent Humston arranged for mail to go once a day to Gosport. The work train will take the clothes pouches to as near as Gosport as possible, and the man with the gasoline launch will come across and get the sacks for delivery. So you can see this first tenuous link in improving travel and communication, and it's the man with the gasoline launch. Uh, March 30th was a big day for Bloomington. The Monon succeeded in getting its track repaired to Gosport, and the waters at Harrodsburg had receded enough uh, that the track was visible. The Western Union Company got its first wire back up on that day. By the 31st, the Monon was running trains as far as Lafayette, where track was still damaged. Mail started to arrive in large quantities. Whoops. We're ahead here. Um, here we go. On April 9th, the first motion pictures of the flood arrived in Bloomington. So in an era without TV, if you wanted to see what was going on, you had to wait till the movie was made, and then the movie had to be released and then taken to the movie houses. So once again, it's amazing how quickly they were able to do that. But, you know, we're 15 days after the, the flood. They've already got a movie produced and out for the audiences. Lines around the block to see it. It was really popular in Bloomington. By April 10th, the flood was mostly a distant memory. The local railroads were open, the, tele the telegraph connections were restored. And the Monon turned tragedy into triumph. And it was the only railroad that had its line open between Chicago and Louisville. 
So all of the traffic that had been backed up now went over the Monon. And the course of the next week, they set all sorts of records. Um, coal was rushed from the mines at Midland to all points. Food was being shipped into the area. The Monon hauled 225 cars of fresh meat from Chicago to Louisville in one day. That's a lot of cars. Uh, and they'd hauled 400 cars in the days preceding. So 600 car loads of food and provisions were shipped out over the Monon. So for me, one of the really interesting things about the 1913 flood in Bloomington is that it illustrates all the things, all the ways that the telegraph and the railroad connected with the city on a daily basis. All the little things that were taken away by the flood and suddenly show up. This, is, this was supposed to be the slide for when I was talking about how much freight the Monon was hauling. That's a Monon passenger train. I couldn't get a freight train image from 1913. You get far enough back and it gets kind of spotty. So here are the ways that the breaking of connections affected Bloomington. First off with communication. Since the railroad and the telegraph often shared the same right-of-way, both were affected at the same time by the flood. Here's a picture from Indianapolis. We can see this is an inner urban track that's been washed out. See that telegraph pole that slid down the bank there? Well, that's cut that telegraph line. So, and this is, happens over and over again. So this close relationship between the telegraph and the train means that they're both cut. Um, and we saw the sort of intermittent news and rumors that were in Bloomington without uh, the telegraph, the, the exaggerated casualties. So we've already seen that effect on communication. But also the mail. There was no mail being delivered. And in an era before the internet, all personal and business communication is going through the U.S. mail. So to have that stopped for a week was really a huge deal. Uh, this is taken on the Baltimore and Ohio. It's not a not a Monon photo, but it shows a guy with a mail sack, and mail sacks flooded into Bloomington after the flood. Um, and it's really not until the 31st, so from the 25th to the 31st, there's no mail. Travel was, of course, affected. Now, in our lives, we want to travel, we hop in a car, but I showed you that slide of the roads in 1913, so travel's pretty much by train, especially any sort of long distance travel at all. So when trains are down, travel stops. I love this slide. It's a Monon steam locomotive waiting at a, at a platform, but what's really cool is you can see the steam escaping in the shadow that you can't see in the photograph because it just kind of blends right in. It's just a, a neat trick. I don't know, it's cool. <laughs> but so how, let's see some of the ways that travel was affected. No school vacation this week? Well, that's because of the flood. The Bloomington Teachers Association were scheduled to go to Indianapolis to attend the Southern Indiana Teachers Association. That trip was postponed, and that meant area school kids didn't get their vacation. I bet they were pretty bitter. I know my son would be. Um, scores of traveling men were stranded in Bloomington. They were in town for business, and with no more trains leaving town, they were in town for the duration. So they toured Bloomington. They toured the IU campus. I think they kind of got bored. Eventually, they toured the saloons. Um, <laughs> but they were waiting for the railroads to open back up. There was a... Uh, Bloomington traveling men were stranded in Indianapolis. They had more to do in Indianapolis, and uh, they, were, they bragged that they got to see a different movie every night of the week. So I guess they didn't suffer too much. Um, local people weren't able to go to a motor show in Indianapolis. Can't get there. A planned wholesale trade division tour of Bloomington, which was going to include 125 of Indianapolis's most important businessmen, didn't happen. The spring semester for IU was set to begin on March 25th. Due to the travel disruption, it didn't start on the 25th. It was on the 27th, uh, classes were delayed, and it wasn't until uh, April 2nd that classes were finally held. And even then, only about half of the expected students showed up. There were. Uh, 
700, there are 900 students who showed up, 700 students were absent. And enrollment actually didn't improve that semester for IU. A local court case had to be postponed because the judge who lived in Bedford couldn't hear the case in Bloomington. <coughs> and uh, perhaps worst of all, on the 25th it was reported that Mrs. D. O. Spencer and her funeral party were to be traveling from Terre Haute to Bloomington. They didn't make it. And they were trapped in Indianapolis from the 25th until the 30th. So poor Mrs. Dio Spencer's body sat in Indianapolis awaiting burial, and her grieving relatives had to wait as well. Interesting to think that people could often name their first trip on the railroad, but a lot of times they couldn't talk about their last. <laughs> Trade. The railroad brought products every day to Bloomington. And of course, the flood stops that. Uh, local grocers start to run out of goods. Fresh fruits and vegetables, almost non-existent by the end of the week. Uh, only staple goods were left. Local bakers, you wouldn't expect this, but local bakers e every day received a shipment of fresh yeast from Indianapolis. Without the yeast, there was no bread. And so local bakers had to turn to dry yeast in town to make their bread. Uh, coal dealers faced dwindling stocks. There were coal yards all around Bloomington at this time because people heated their houses with coal. And without coal being delivered, coal was still being burned, the coal st stocks started to dwindle. Um, this is of the Bloomington Coal Company, which was immediately behind the Illinois Central uh, Freight Depot down there by uh, Morton. Uh, what else? Well, I'm skipping ahead. There were no new films. All the movies that came to Bloomington came in by train. And so when the flood cut the railroad, no new movies at the Rex or the Crescent. So while those guys in Indianapolis were watching a different movie every night of the week, we didn't get to see any. Local businesses also faced problems with stocking items. If you wanted something, you could order it. And remember how Montgomery Ward died in 1913? Mail order business was a, a big part of American business by that time. So people were ordering things constantly, couldn't do it. None of those goods would arrive. This apparently did not apply to wallpaper. Not affected our wallpaper stock, so Bloomington could still wallpaper. Whew, flood's over. And I'm sure people in Bloomington, somebody probably said, you know, it could never rain again, and I'd be happy with that. <laughs> so, the spring crops looked good. Spring crop showing. Uh, matter of fact, the May 14th Evening World reported that with the exception of a very few isolated places, the spring crops in Indiana make a showing that is nothing short of being remarkable. It also noted that corn planting was proceeding rapidly and was already completed in a few areas. So it started out great. June had normal rainfall. Crops looked good. Everybody was happy. But then the last week of June, it changed. The weather turned. There was an intense heat wave from Denver to Pittsburgh. Temperatures were over 100 degrees for six days. And that promising start to the growing season uh, turned south. It was 102 degrees in Chicago. Chicago doesn't normally get that hot. 46 people died in Chicago from the heat wave. And it's, <laughs> yeah, maybe it was. Um, so this heat wave coincides with a drought. It stops raining, and the crops get worse. OK, now this is the Palmer Drought Severity Index. It's put out by the National Climactic Data Center. And what they do is they take old climate data, and they map it. And so as you can see, everything Orange, red, and purple is drought. Everything over here is moist. So for June 1913, Indiana is normal. 
This would be the last month of normal rainfall for a long time. July 1913, we see the drought creeping in. I'm pretty sure we're in this section right here, but since they don't do a very good job of showing the county boundaries, it's hard to tell. But so there's July, August, September, October, November, December, 1914, January. It keeps going, February, March, April. I was like, how many slides are they going to want to look at of this weather map? Uh, here's May still going on. July, things got really bad that next summer, 1914. August, Indiana does not leave a state of drought throughout the entire year of 1914. And it lasts until March of 1915. So the drought is almost a two year long drought. And finally, May 1915. Indiana returned to normal precipitation. So this is a serious drought. We don't hear a lot about it. Droughts aren't as sexy as floods, uh, but it was an equally great catastrophe for the citizens of Monroe County. Now, um, Bloomington lucked out in the flood. It's far from major rivers. It didn't receive that much damage. It's high and dry, but those very Advantages for the flood would be disadvantages for the drought. Surface water often tends to dry up in Bloomington during the summer. That's one theory as to why Native American settlements, why there are no permanent Native American settlements in Monroe County. Uh, that they would hunt through here, but they didn't stay because the water didn't stay. Now the first settlers to the area addressed this with wells and cisterns, and they gathered water as best they could for the summer dry months. Um, and then in 1902, in, uh, Bloomington got its first reservoir, and that was the mo already mentioned Monon Pond. The Illinois Central Spring fed the Monon Pond. I don't know if that's a con conflicting company interest there, but the Monon Pond was here, and it was built by the Monon to supply its locomotives with water. Steam locomotives use an incredible amount of water, and they can't deal with this summer drought every year in Bloomington. So, you know, in 1902, they're already trying to address Bloomington's water problems. Um, this is a view from Rose Hill looking down towards where the Monon Pond would have been. Sort of this nondescript area down here. This has all been redeveloped over here. This is that, uh, I don't know, what is the name of that room? <coughs> Behind Crescent Donuts. Adams. Adams. That area has been redeveloped. Uh, and the Monon Pond would have sat right down in here. Bloomington uh, also had reservoirs of its own besides the Monon Pond. And in 1913, they had two, well, three. Uh, what am I looking at here? <laughs> here? Here we have Bloomington. This shows the bypass around the west side of town. Near to that bypass, Bloomington had its uh, waterworks. So they had two lakes here, twin lakes. They had an upper lake and a lower lake. The upper lake leaked. They built another dam to catch the water, so they had a lower lake. They also had a lake here, Weimer Lake. It's also called Lake Wapahani by some people. It's the Wapahani Bike Park. Yeah, it's still there. And one of twin lakes is still there. The other one has become a ball diamond. So between these three lakes, Bloomington did have the ability to store some water. Unfortunately, they built the lakes in the portion of the county that doesn't hold water. Geologically, it's not right. It's like trying to store wa water in a colander. And so you can imagine if your colander is in your sink and you fill up the sink, the colander's full. But when the sink drains, the colander drains. And that's the same thing that happened to these reservoirs. The groundwater level was up, the reservoirs held water. When the groundwater level went down, the reservoirs didn't. Guess when you need the reservoirs to hold water? When it's dry. So this was a problem. 
But Bloomington was cheap, and so this was a problem that wouldn't be easy to fix. IU had gotten tired of dealing with uh, Bloomington's water problems. Here's a slide. This is uh, Lake Wapahani today. Um, IU had gotten tired of dealing with Bloomington's water problems, so they would built a lake of their own. Not that one. That's Griffey. This little one. That's University Lake. It's in behind the IU golf course. And uh, let's see, do I have one when it was built? I don't have one when it was built, but it was a small lake, but it was geologically sound. The IU uh, professors had gone out and looked at what parts of the county can hold water, and they realized that the Griffey Creek watershed was one of those parts. So the lake was small, but it didn't drain out. Here they are building the dam. Here they are standing by their proud new lake. So the Monon had a solution to water problems. City of Bloomington had a tenuous solution to water problems. And Indiana University had their own solution to water problems. But this year wasn't going to be a normal year. And so the water problems that Bloomington normally had were going to be exacerbated by the drought. There's University Lake today. Fuzzy picture, sorry about that. By July, Bloomington's water supply had become a political issue. And you can just barely see it says, election must be held on water proposition. What was Bloomington going to do about its water? And so they were talking about different long-term solutions. And these would involve building more reservoirs, pumping in water from other places. They had a whole list of ideas. And at the same time that this is an issue for Bloomington, IU is letting out contracts to raise the height of University Dam. They're, gonna, they're trying to double the size of the lake in 1913 because they realize the water problems they're facing. In late July, uh, Bloomington troops went up to Fort Benjamin Harrison for their normal maneuvers, and they reported it was a miserable time. It was hot, and it was really dusty. They've got 50 minutes of rest after drill, and they spent the entire 50 minutes cleaning the dust off their uniforms and equipment before they went out and drilled again, only to repeat it. So this is the effects of the drought. So the drought goes on, and Twin Lakes isn't holding water, and Weimar Lake's not holding water, and so they're looking around for other sources of water, and there's this mill out further west called Leonard's Mill, and it has a spring that seems to be pretty good. And so they wonder, could we get that spring water to one of our lakes? And so they actually come up with a plan to pipe water from Leonard's Mill, temporarily, above ground, to Weimar Lake, and then from Weimar Lake, they can get to the Twin Lakes, and from Twin Lakes, they can get it into downtown Bloomington. So that's their, their first solution. So on August 18th, plans were announced to capture the water from Leonard's Mill. And this helps the city water supply into September. This is a photograph of uh, the creek just after the spring at Leonard's Mill. And this is a locating photograph. Here's Weimer Lake. Uh, there's the ballpark at Twin Lakes, and then that right there is the old lake that used to be at Leonard Springs. They built a temporary dam in 1913 to catch water. Later on, they would put in a more permanent dam. So, it gets down, it starts to get really bad. There's only, by, uh, October 10th, it was announced that the city reservoirs were almost dry and that there were only a few weeks left of water. They started talking about long-term solutions. Uh, one idea was that they should put concrete in the bottom of the reservoirs. That way they'd hold water. So if we just concrete the bottoms, but that was expensive and you'd have to drain the lakes to do that. So that wasn't a very good solution in the interim. Uh, another solution that was thought perhaps they could build a pipeline to the White River but imagine a pipeline, then you'd have to have pump houses along the way. It would have been a huge undertaking. Uh, another idea was perhaps you could take that temporary dam at Leonard's Mill and make it into a permanent dam, and then you could catch water there. Uh, and the final idea, and this was probably the best idea, but it was relatively expensive, was to build a brand new reservoir and a brand new waterworks on the Griffey Creek watershed. 
So while these long-term debates are going on, Bloomington runs out of water. On October 14th, water use was restricted to dwellings and hotels. All other businesses would not receive water. The, the upper lake was drained into the lower lake, leaving behind buckets of fish. Um, but th the water was dwindling. Local stone mills were forced to close, and the mighty Showers Brothers plant had to shut down. All of these production facilities are being fueled by coal, which is then boiling water to make the steam. So without the water, you can't run your factories. Something had to be done. Bloomington was going to starve from lack of water. And there, what could Bloomington turn to? The long-term solutions were too far out. There, what short-term solution could the city possibly come up with to secure water? What organization would be big enough, large enough, powerful enough to move something so heavy and awkward as water? What about the railroad? The railroad could haul water. After all, the railroad hauled oil. It hauled, it had tank cars. It, what's the difference between water and oil, right? Well, one burns, one doesn't. But besides that, technically, feasibly, it would work. So I'm not exactly sure the date the Monon started hauling water to Bloomington. But they did. Uh, Tank cars were coming from Gosport to Bloomington by the 10th and of October and from Bedford to Bloomington by the 16th. So they were getting water from both branches of the White River, from the north and from the south. Now, local industries would order the tank cars of water, and the tank cars would be delivered to the local industry, and then the water would be used to fuel their boiler. And, and with this mechanism, Bloomington was able to keep its factories open throughout October. Uh, this is not a slide of Bloomington. This is a slide of the Monon hauling water, though. What we have here is uh, Monon tank cars. They've been filled up with water, and they're discharging their water into the creek. Why would they discharge their water into the creek? The answer lies in this pipe right here in the background. If we go around to the other side of the bridge, we see that pipe runs up to a pump, and then that pump runs to a water tower. I believe these are from Salem. Is that correct, Ron? Yeah, Paul. Salem, Indiana. Uh, not Bloomington, but it's the mechanism by which the Monon could haul the water. They could dump it into a stream, and then pumps from the stream could take it up into uh, the factories. Or I don't know what's going on with this one. Oh, yes, I do. Um, Where is it on my thing? On October 14th, there we go, the uh, inspector for the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company arrived in Bloomington, and he was not happy. Bloomington, lacking water, was under extreme danger for fire, and he basically said that a lot of our policies are going to have to be canceled until Bloomington comes up with a better, better solution for water. So there he is, the special inspector for fire insurance company. Another customer of water from the Monon Railroad was the city of Bloomington. The city of Bloomington in 1913 had centralized heating around the courthouse square. This is because all the people living close together downtown, if they were all burning coal uh, for their individual heat, for their individual stoves, all that, the uh, amount of smoke would have been bad for downtown. Also, the fire danger was great, all these people with all their fires. So instead, they centralized this. And they had a uh, boiler, and the boiler produced steam, and the steam was piped to different downtown buildings uh, around the square. Central Indiana Lighting Company and the City Heating Plant. There it is. There's their big tank for gas. Um, they also, of course, had to have a water tank. The Monon started delivering them water, and that water was used to heat the city of Bloomington um, into the winter of 1913. And here in the background, we can see the city heating plant right there. They made gas right there. 
Yes, that was the other thing they did. Which I won't bring into this story because it's already long enough. Um, and this is, this is showing roughly the site of where it would have been. On October 16th, the drought claimed a railroad casualty. Whoop. I guess I don't have a slide of it. At the end here, it gets kind of sketchy on my slides. But on October 16th, the drought claimed a railroad casualty. A Monon man was badly burned in an accident in Bedford. The railroad was hauling water, and they were hauling them in old uh, oil tank cars. Some of the cars had apparently just had oil in them. This is why he didn't want to drink this stuff, and they were using it for boilers. But the, uh, the Monon employee was checking these cars, and he was taking the lids off of the cars. And as he was going along, it was at night, his lantern ignited gas that had pooled up in the top of the car, and it exploded. Um, he was hurled backwards onto the station platform, and he was severely burned. Um, his name was John Anderson, and he was described as a young married man of Louisville. Uh, it's said in the paper that he probably survived. I don't have a follow-up on that, but he was surely scarred for the rest of his life. Um, November, let's see, so the city gets through October with the Monon, with the water from Leonard Springs, with these different emergency measures, no businesses getting water, just residents. So the city makes it through October. Um, on October 31st, though, they're still announcing the serious danger of fire. There's no water in the city water mains, and probably will not be for several days. It would take four or five hours to fill the pipe. In other words, during that time, the town would burn. So don't start any fires. So that's October 31st. Now, November is going to provide a little bit more relief. It's weather's cold. There is more rain in November. It's still drought, but there's more rain than there had been. Um, and so Bloomington continued to just get by, but they started to get worried because if cold weather hit, those temporary pipes from Leonard Springs wouldn't work anymore, nor would they be able to haul water in the water cars on the Monon. So they needed more rain before it got really cold. And then on November 14th, it was announced that the Gentry Brothers Circus would not return to Bloomington for the winter. It always wintered in Bloomington, but that year it wasn't going to because of the lack of water. Elephants need a lot of water. Or in this case, 50 wonderful educated dogs and ponies. I would have liked to see that show. <laughs> Finally, in December, a blizzard hits Bloomington. Uh, well, some snowfall. And then later on in the month, there's more snowfall. So the water crisis starts to ease. But really, the drought would continue throughout the rest of 1914, on into 1915. But this is the end of the drought in 1913. So this is where we're going to end. Now, the final solution for Bloomington's water supplies wouldn't be reached for many years. And they would actually do a lot of the interim solutions along the way. They'd build Leonard Springs. They'd build Griffey. They'd build Lake Lemon. And they'd build Lake Monroe. And each one of these has been announced as the last time Bloomington will ever have to need more water. So in conclusion, 1913 was a tumultuous year for Bloomington and water. In March, there was just way too much. And then in the rest of the year, there wasn't enough. The Easter storm and flood produced the greatest amount of damage ever recorded in the Hoosier State. It's our, still to this day is the worst natural disaster that has ever befallen Indiana. And then the drought that began in 1913 is one of the worst droughts to ever hit Indiana. So they're certainly memorable for those reasons. But in telling these stories about Bloomington and water, another story is also revealed. And that's that in 1913, we're really at the heyday, the height of railroads' power. And so every story that you try to tell leads back to the railroad. The flood shows us all the ways that the railroad connected to ordinary, ordinary everyday life. And the drought shows us the ways that the railroad could be used in extraordinary times to overcome extraordinary circumstances. So that's all she wrote, as they say. 
Um, that concludes my talk. If you, anybody has any questions, I would be happy to entertain them. Yes. Yes. Whoops. Get me back there. That is at Williams. Williams. Of uh, Williams Dam fame. That's the hotel. Uh, the dam would be back here. I don't think so, but I can't say for certain. I don't, re I don't recognize any of the stuff behind it there. Yeah, and it be it became a huge it became a huge political issue. And IU was telling them, guys, it's going to leak. We know it's going to leak. But because of the expense, and because it became entrenched, one party was for it, the other party was against it. Um, it they went ahead and built it anyway. They were trying to save money. <laughs> University Lake, or I mean, uh, Leonard Springs. No, not I have no specifics on it. And it's supposed it's right in a storm or something and Okay. It was Leonard Springs Dam uh when it was breached. And the, the answer apparently is 43. I don't know. It's after 1913, so it's not appearing in this film. What was your, what was your question? Uh, my father was counting on stuff about that Leonard Springs Dam breaching. There was some discussion years ago if that was purposely dynamited in some kind of a dispute, but I didn't know if that was actual fact or not. I didn't know anybody else had heard that. I haven't heard that. I wouldn't say that it could be unheard of. Uh, dams often cause problems between neighbors. Um, farmers were regularly upset by dam construction, so I don't know. I don't think it was just neighbors, it was some kind of a political deal, uh, what he referred to. That could be as well. I, I have no idea. Anybody else? All right, thank you very much.